All right, I suggest that we get started and we may have some other people join midway, but that'll be fine. So hello everyone and welcome to Data Inventories for the Modern Age. <clears throat> we have with us Julia Lane and Nancy Potok. Nancy was the Chief Statistician of the United States and Julia is the co-founder of the Coleridge Initiative. Coleridge is a not-for-profit organization originally established at NYU and it's working with governments to ensure that data are more effectively used for public decision making. Chorus partnered with Julia and Coleridge on the Show Us the Data project in 2021, and there's been considerable activity since the workshop last October. So over to you, to Julia and Nancy, and we look forward to hearing um, more about these exciting activities. Okay, thanks, Howard. Um, and since it's a small group, jump in. Um, this is by way of being just an update on what we've been doing. Um, we promised as part of the uh, agreement with Chorus that we'd uh, kind of keep you posted. Uh, so if you've got any particular questions, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll uh, drill down. So um, the, here's the, the basic setup. Um, I'm, you, I'll remind you of the background. We've done a whole bunch of uh, activities uh, since the conference that, that Chorus uh, co-sponsored with us and you guys co-sponsored. Uh, so I'm going to spell out those subs and then you can kind of ask questions about next steps. So it, I think it's fair to say the show us the data was a huge success. We uh, kicked off massive engagement with the agencies and with the community. Um, we've got uh, a lot of uh, interest in particular with OMB and OSTP. Um, the uh, there is the formation of interagency groups, and uh, Nancy will talk a little bit about that, but, um, and also for the National AI Task Force, uh, building a search and discovery portal is, is uh, one of the major recommendations of the data subcommittee. So what have we been doing since that? Um, well, uh, the agencies that were involved, you will recall that there were um, uh, uh, three agencies initially. So on the statistical side, uh, two more agencies have joined in, and Nancy will talk about that, the National Center for Education Statistics and National Agricultural Statistics Service have joined in the NSF and the USDA ERS. And on the programmatic side, uh, NOAA has been uh, working with us for a long time and they pulled in NASA because obviously a lot of NOAA data come from satellite uh, and there's massive amounts of data challenges that they face. So I actually have a call right after this with, with NASA. Um, the, uh, because of my involvement with the National AI Task Force, uh, we, as you'll see in a minute, we're, um, Dan Stanzioni, who runs the Texas Advanced Computing Center, uh, he and I have been, you know, kind of thought partners on uh, the need for a search and discovery platform for his 35,000 researchers who use the data at TAC, but also more broadly for the AI community. So um, you'll see in a minute, they're building uh, uh, the API as well as the visualization tools. So that's uh, uh, joint with them. NOAA wanted to work uh, closely with, uh, they have a set of cooperative institutes. Um, so there are 15 of them and they're basically internal and external NOAA researchers. So um, the, the uh, University of Washington is uh, leading one of the cooperative institutes. And what they're doing is they're uh, working with us to do the validation of the metadata feeds, uh, uh, providing input into the structure of the API, as well as the visualizations, which I'll talk about in just a minute. NAS uh, is very much doing the same thing. So, and Nancy will talk a bit more about the statistical agency shortly. Um, what do the metadata feeds look like? Uh, so we've been working with the agencies to, to target to identify data sets they're interested in. We've been running the models on, corp, uh, on the corpus. We're working with agencies. And um, uh, as you just heard from univers uh, a, a University Collaborative to um, validate. So um, the actual metadata feeds that we're working uh, on are the standard ones that we talked about before. 
Uh, we also uh, have been adding to the metadata these podcasts. So Nancy, do you want to say a little bit about the podcast? Sure. Um, one of the uh, areas where we thought we could really add some value to the metadata is for people who show up kind of at the top of the leaderboard in terms of the number of publication um, articles that they've done using particular data sets that are part of what we're um, looking at in this pilot. Um, so we're doing some demo podcasts where we actually do about five minutes of Q&A with the researchers to talk about um, the data. So we've, I, we're, we're doing um, a handful of them right now, but really hope to expand this so that if you were using the tool and you were in search capacity, let's say, in um, you know, we talk a little bit about what some of these dashboards would look like or what the, you know, how how the data are arrayed. But if you're clicking and you you're you get to the point where there's a researcher who's named, who's associated with a particular data set that they were using in their research, um, like the survey of earned doctorates, which is one example up here. Um, but, you know, could be any one of these data sets that we're searching for in, in the publications. Um, then they would, we're doing like, a, I'm hosting these podcasts where I introduce them and ask them four questions, basically about why is your research important and how are you using this data and what would you want people to know about the data set um, and how could it be improved? And um, why is you know why is why is collecting this data a great use of uh, taxpayer money? What difference are you making with your research using these data? Um, so I'm very excited about that. And what I think ultimately what we'd like to do is to have a lot of these with um, the top researchers that would just be embedded in the metadata. So when you're looking and you click on the researcher, you click on the data, you can also click on the podcast and um, hear something about it. And we're talking to um, the Harvard Data Science Review, which is a, a digital publication, um, to see if we can't also make these available as part of a regular column in the review so that um, it'll reach a broader audience of, of um, people and bring some of the researchers themselves also to to start looking at the Harvard Data Science Review. Um, so we're that's that's a possibility. So we definitely want it in the metadata, but um, we're also looking to advertise it more broadly. And so this actually came out of the agency request because what they want to do is obviously show the data use. And obviously we're doing that with the, with the visualizations, but also um, what they want to be able to do is when, for example, for NAS, uh, their specific example was they're trying to get users or res survey respondents to show to see how wonderful their uh, how their data responses are used. So they want to, for example, be able to send a clip to uh, their legislatures or to the um, uh, to farmers uh, who are responding to ag census stuff. So it's a way of bringing it to life, um, and we think it's going to be cool because we're hoping. Oh, and you can hear I got the thing going, but the the you can get the slides afterwards and listen to the podcast. Um, the basic idea there is to uh, then researchers we can show how much it's been downloaded. Uh, the agency can highlight the most downloaded uh, podcast and so on. So we'll we'll see how that all goes. We'll go into the API. Um, so we got the metadata feeds. Uh, then next thing is uh, validation. So NAS put 17 of their staff on it, on the validation. They've um, validated 1900 rows at this point, because obviously some of the predictions are, are correct, some of them are not. And it helps us build another corpus. University of Washington is putting seven of their subject matter experts on the validation. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, so it's a very quick thing to check the snippets. 
and then they can, if they're interested in the census of agriculture, then they can say yes or no. Uh, that uh, so it links it to their um, uh, to the the way in which it was cited in the text. Uh, it's been really uh, quick for them to do, and then it gives us much better curated data set for the next round of the ML model. Uh, that validated data set, then can I can I ask? Yeah, sure. Mark. If you could just go back that slide. Sure. Oops. Um, so part of identifying it is, I mean, the census of agriculture, of course, is, uh, I, well, actually, I never heard of it before, but, um, but it's tied to a particular year or version. And so is the expectation that you would be identifying specific versions or just the fact that it's a census of? Oh, that's a great question. Like so um, if we talk about it, actually, um, I can send you, if you're interested, the um, the write-up that we did of the whole approach uh, that we, um, so it's, it's kind of a cross between a, a, an academic paper and in the technical appendix is the, um, is, is some of these very hard issues like what exactly is a data set, right? Um, so it's, it's like anything in science, uh, developing immutable taxonomies is, doesn't work. So, we, we are, for this purpose, responding to what NASA's interests were, which was simply the census of agriculture. Um, and you can imagine the definition of a data set varying depending on the user community. Like, um, for example, I work a lot with UI wage records, so I might be much more interested in Michigan wage records than California wage records or whatever, but you can imagine it being more narrow as the user community iterates on it. Yeah, I would and just, in fact, I would, the, sorry. I was just gonna add to that, that, um, you know, with some of these data sets, they, they happen on regular cycles. So the census of agriculture is done every five years. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily, you know, if you're looking at the data, you're not going to see data necessarily from every single year, but the searches can do, I think, specific ranges of at least when the research was published. And then you can um, sort of identify at that point, well, was, you know, are people sort of linking things longitudinally? How is this really being used? Um, but it, Right now, I think, as Julia said, we're, we're being driven in this pilot work by what the agencies want to know, what's most important to them at this point, because there's many ways you can slice and dice the, the timing and the, the increments of, of the data as when it's released versus when the research comes out. Apropos to that, one of the interesting things here is um, you may never have heard about the Census of Agriculture, but it is an important census activity. It used to be done by the US Census Bureau up until 1988. Is that right, Nancy? Sorry, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, it moved in the 1990s. In the 1990s, okay. Um, and it turns out NASA is only interested in how NAS census, but so you'll see there's a different thing there. Um, and the, uh, but obviously for the taxpayer's point of view, they invested in the census of agriculture for many decades beyond that. So it's really interesting for a taxpayer to see for how many years back those investments are still being used because that obviously drives the ROI sky high. So, um, a lot, lot of issues. We're not solving all the problems. This is the first step on what I think is going to be a, a really big uh, uh, advance in empirical work. Does that answer your questions, Mark? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I didn't expect an easy answer, of course. I just wanted to know like what the expectation would be for somebody who was validating a snippet or something like that. Yeah, so, we they come uh, back and ask lots of questions. So as usual, you're learning a lot from their questions. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so TAC has been putting together the API. Uh, there are uh, seven endpoints, I think, the ones you'd expect, uh, publication, author, topic, and so on. Um, and we're getting feedback from the uh, uh, both University of Washington and the 
agencies as to um, the structure of that API. Uh, that'll be done, we hope, by the end of the month. Um, then the final step, and I'll show you some of the uh, some of the um, wireframes in just a second. But here was uh, in talking to the user community, we kind of conflated in the show us the data conference that there are actually three possible use cases. There are probably more, but we narrowed it down to three. So the administrator of the agency is interested in a dashboard that they could have on their desk or that they could pull up that answers the types of questions identified there. So what uh, TAC is doing is putting, um, you know, wireframes together that could uh, deal with these. And I'll show you the wireframes in just a minute. Uh, the researchers want to use it as a search, search and discovery platform. And, uh, you know, they, so that's why we've got being able to be filtered by different uh, topic areas. Uh, so we think this is, these are the initial thoughts. Uh, and then the a community dashboard. So that this is more the data inventory idea where um, you're um, highlighting the value of the data set to state legislatures, uh, obviously congressional representatives. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, so maps are going to be important. And you'll see in those latter two, the podcast ranked by views is kind of highlighting the researchers. So we think about this as like citation type impact for, for the researcher, hoping that they'll put it on their LinkedIn site, on their social media and so on. Um, NASA and NOAA were particularly interested in uh, uh, network visualizations. Uh, so this is one possible visualization we actually did with um, a USDA data set. And let me um, just go out of sharing mode and then uh, show you what the wireframes look like. Um, so just to make it clear that these are the initial ways in which the wireframes being visualized. That's what we're getting feedback from, from the um, university, uh, the academic and the agency community. Uh, so that, that's kind of the, the core idea there. And then last, um, so let me go back to presentation mode. Uh, so uh, that's it. So let me stop and I, I wanted to stay on time so people had questions. Uh, Nancy, there's a question there on the podcast. But yeah, where they yeah. can be found on the on where, the whether the podcast can be found on the web. So not yet. Okay. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get them on the website of the Harvard Data Science Review um, as a website. If that column doesn't work out, we'll um, be exploring options for where we could host podcasts um, to make them available on the web versus, you know, a link that's when you actually are using the tool because um, we definitely want it as part of the tool and then the question is what about separate from that so right. we're, i was just thinking you want more exposure rather than less <clears throat> so right you think about where we could link to it potentially from chorus data or whatever yeah as soon as we have that like home Right. You know, we, I mean, they'll, they'll stream on Spotify or something like that, but you have to be able to have the link somewhere. So, yeah. Right. And then, um, you know, so to the extent that uh, universities um, or institutions are interested in submitting podcasts or you know, I, I imagine we could handle feeds from other places as well. So uh, just these five minute ideas would, uh, uh, have been used in other situations and have been wildly popular. So the agencies were super interested in adding that to the metadata. Yeah, um, if it's okay, Julie, I'll just take a minute and sort of explain um, what we're doing with the statistical agencies. Yeah, please do. And then we'll so, talk a little bit about a possible conference in July. 
Yeah, we've, um, you know, we're trying to get the agencies to talk to each other um, so that they are sharing their knowledge and experience and, um, you know, they're not all reinventing the wheel in separate silos. And when we get some synergy from them, um, we were initially hoping that um, we could get someplace like OMB or the Office of um, Science and Technology Policy to really kind of organize them as cross federal agency group, but the wheels of bureaucracy turn very slowly. And in the meantime, um, we didn't want And they were enthusiastic about it. So it's just, there's been so much, uh, you probably have read the headlines on OSTP and then there's been quite a lot going on on the um, OMB side as well, so. Yeah, it just, I mean, it's the normal kind of, it's, it's not an unusual amount of time for the, for those federal agencies to get something started up, but we move at a much faster speed and we're on a faster trajectory and we didn't want to just wait for that. Um, so in the meantime, um, we organized the heads, at least of the statistical agencies to kind of form together as a group because they have really a lot in common. And um, it's very exciting because now we have the agency heads of um, the Economic Research Service, NAS, um, National Center for Education Statistics, and the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics all talking to each other. And they are, um, I've organized the group and they're, they're very enthusiastic. They're really excited about working with each other on this project. So now we have some um, continuity from what I would call the engaged worker bee level, who's actually doing the validations and pulling the data sets and things like that. They've got a lot of support from the top and the value proposition to them has been really, really obvious um, because they are in the positions where they're talking to like the Secretary of Agriculture or um, the head of, of NSF. And they want to be able to articulate and show these visualizations about how their data are being used and what the outcomes are. And this is exactly the tool that they've been looking at that puts at their fingertips the ability to say, look, there were like 900 articles published using this data set. Um, and here's some feedback that we're getting. And here's some money we need to invest in this. Or they might have... Um, for them, it's very interesting to know also, um, like, here's this really great data set. It looks like nobody's really using it. Um, how can we do some more outreach and really make sure people are aware that this is available for some of the things that we think they want to do based on the research that we're seeing out there? So they're, they're all in, which is really exciting. And I'm going to be meeting with them and convening them on a regular basis to, to um, keep this going um i see uh howard you had another question about how can the publishers help us uh so we're just providing an update as requested i mean i think um your thoughts here kind of thing i think we would like to run another conference on show us the data value in uh in the summer uh, as these um uh, as the platform kind of evolves and, and getting you guys involved in that process would be very helpful. You were so helpful before uh, in getting it launched and so on. So, yeah, yeah, I think the the other question, Howard, was about data.gov and data inventories. Yeah. Um, and that is really in the purview of the chief data officers and the agency. So we've been trying to engage them as well. And they would be very involved as part of like a, an interagency group that OMB would form. Um, but I think in the individual agencies, you know, it, we're, we're engaging, trying to engage with the CDOs in the agencies where we're running the pilot. Um, but GSA, which runs data.gov, has been in the same position that OMB and the Offices of um, Science and Technology Policy has been, which is that they've had a lot of turnover in the leadership and in the people who've been working on this. So we are still hoping that they will engage at some point 
Um, we'd like to see that because especially if there's all this great metadata that can support the inventories of all the federal data, they would, that would be ideal. But we're just not waiting for them to get their act together, basically. Oh, yeah. Again, there's been about 50% turnover in the OCIO. So we had really good engagement with GSA and uh, all the people quit. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, with the OFCIO, it's been a little bit the same thing. I mean, we'll get there. It's just typical. Sure. Your government at work. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Um, yeah, I can imagine those fertile kinds of hurdles and stuff that you uh, run into. But uh, I was just wondering, you know, um, is the, the longer term picture, you know, um, a lot of the work that you're doing is, you know, taking you know, untagged text basically, right? And using the machine learning to extract out stuff and enrich the data and then be able to improve the services and the visibility of all of that, which is terrific. But um, I think I was under the impression eventually that some of these like machine learning tools would be available for their upstream, say to publishers, for instance, so that we could actually do the enrichment further upstream to make it easier for you and the agencies in order to be able to extract the information that you want? Is that is that a path that you're- That would be fantastic. To to so right now the machine learning tools are public, right? They're on the website, um, The but they're not ready for prime time, right? So they were just the Kaggle competition output. Um, what would be kind of maybe two steps down or three steps down would be, um, we're getting a better validated corpus each time through. We can improve the machine learning prob, uh, um, uh, models, you know, that may be a focus in the fall. Uh, if you guys are interested in working with us on hosting another Kaggle competition and then applying them when your scientists submit. Remember, we talked a little bit about that in saying, as you saw with the validation tool, we think this is the data set to which you're referring, is that correct? And then you could automatically, I mean, this was Howard's vision a little bit, you could automatically either find the related DOI and pop it in the references uh, or create a DOI for it and then pop it over to um, the uh, an archive or repository. I think that would be a really, phenomenal position for the publishers to sit in. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and then you could imagine on your sites, you know, hosting a tool that showed here are the data sets that our researchers used, here are the top research. So the same kind of, you saw the use case for the visualization, you could do the same thing for your, for your journal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We're thinking along those kinds of lines. So, uh, so yeah. with an API, you know, that the API would have that information. So you could just keep feeding the API and improving it. So mm -hmm. Todd, Julie, Plato, do you have any other questions for Julia or Nancy? No, I don't have any questions, but it's very interesting and uh, looking forward to hearing more about it and getting, well, diving a little deeper into it than um, and the information currently. So, Been a lot of work. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a lot, many more results to come, right, Julia? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we are thank out of so time. Um, but thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, thank you very much to Nancy and, and Julia for giving us a, an exciting update. And uh, we'll be sure to share this with more of our members. And we'll, we'll definitely be discussing the July conference with you. Sure. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Thanks you guys. guys. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care.